Thank you all for being here and I know, for what I know is going to be a fantastic symposium. Um, this is the Symposium on Population Health Impact of Racial Bias and Social Injustice, an example of pr police brutality in black men, um, is actually a, a multi-interest group and task force venture. Um, and probably one of the, probably as the most number of interest groups and task forces to come together around a particular topic. Um, this is a joint collaboration with the Minorities in Medicine Interest Group, the Criminal Justice and Health Interest Group, Physicians Against Violence Interest Group, the Social Responsibility Interest Group, and the Disparities Task Force. Um, and um, I think it's a real testament to the importance of this issue for us and our patients. Um, the symposium was made possible by the generous support of the Aetna Foundation. Um, and the University of Michigan Hospital and Health Systems Office of Health Equity and Inclusion um, and their Medical School Information Services and Yale University School of Medicine, Department of Internal Medicine. On behalf of the organizing group, I'd just like to introduce all the people who worked very hard on this. And first and foremost is Dr. Jesse Marshall, who was the, our fearless leader and obtained funding and kept us on task. Um, and then just in alphabetical order, I believe it is, Giselle Corby, Corby Smith, Leonard Agetti, did I say it right? Um, Oliver Fine, Inahia Canal, Leroy Hicks, myself, Jane Leapshoots, um, Ebony Price Haywood, Nicole Redmond, George Shelton, and LaChauncey Woodward. Uh, growing up the way uh, I was, where I was raised, uh, and the way I was raised, you become completely aware of what you cannot do as a black man. And one of the things that we were always told um, is that, uh, you know, the police will do this and you have to behave a certain way um, because if you behave differently, if you uh, object, um, if you uh, don't acquiesce immediately to the request and stand there silently or sit there with your hands at 10 and 2 or whatever the case may be, um, you'll be beaten, you might get shot, uh, at the very least you'll get arrested, um, and that's the way it is. And so it, it became so mundane and routine that I, I think myself along with you know a multitude of people just assume that that's life as a black man it's a feeling of of helplessness to think about that at any point in time you can be placed into a jail situation or accosted not because of you crossing a behavioral line but because someone else decided that you didn't belong wherever you were at that given time This particular in incident was kind of a, a, a scary moment for me. I felt that it really didn't matter what I said, what I did, what my accomplishments are at the time as a college student. I, I kind of felt diminished. I kind of felt demeaned. So my encounter with law enforcement that I'd like to share here today occurred when I was 20 years old, a sophomore at the University of Toronto in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. It was a Sunday evening, I was attending a church service, and the service was almost over when all of a sudden, a person that I didn't know dressed in plain clothes said to me, police, you're coming with me. And I looked at him and said, I don't think so. If you're a police officer, I'd like to see your badge. To which he said, he wants to see my effing badge. You're gonna pay for this. And as I was standing there dumbfounded, his colleague bumped me out of the pew where I was sitting into the aisle, and one of them took each arm and escorted me out of the sanctuary to the foyer where I met the commanding officer. And I was quite shaken up and said to the commanding officer, you ought to talk to this officer of yours because I don't think he's following protocol. 
At which point, the officer who had arrested me, essentially, came right up in my face and said, and swore at me. Um, <clears throat> so after that, I was taken outside of the church. There were several other officers there, some of whom had shotguns. And I was eventually placed in the squad car and taken to headquarters. On the way to headquarters, the officer was extremely demeaning. And um, we got to the headquarters. I was searched, fingerprinted, photographed. And that's really the beginning of the story. OK. Um so again, I'm Jesse Marshall of the University of Michigan. It is my great pleasure to see you all join us today. Um, I want to start off by saying the goal of this symposium is to heighten the awareness of the health implications of racial bias and social injustice from a population health perspective. It is our hope that discussing this topic among generalist physicians and colleagues, um, leaders in the field, may uh, lead to innovative practices and diminish future racial bias and social injustices um, and promote healing on the community level. Before I introduce our esteemed panel, um, I want to uh, make you aware that we are recording this uh, session because the uh, goal is to produce a podcast that you'll be informed through SJM um, at a later time when it is available. So with that, um, I'm going to just uh, introduce all three panelists um, at the same time and then they'll just come up one after the other. So first, Dr. Kamara Jones. She is president of the American Public Health Association and a senior fellow at the Satcher Health Leadership Institute and Cardiovascular Research Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine. Dr. Jones is a family physician and an epidemiologist who works, focuses on the impacts of racism on the health and well-being of the nation. She seeks to broaden the national health debate to include not only universal access to high quality health care, but also to uh, bring the attention to social determinants of health and the social uh, determinants particularly focused on equity, including racism. Um, as a methodologist, she has developed new methods for comparing full distribution of data rather than simply comparing means or proportions um, in order to investigate population level risk factors and propose population level interventions. As a social epidemiologist, her work on race associated differences in health outcomes goes beyond uh, documenting those differences to vigorously investigating the structural causes of those differences. As a teacher, her allegories of race and racism eliminate topics that are otherwise difficult for many Americans to understand or even to discuss. She hopes through her work to initiate a national conversation on racism that will result in a national campaign against racism. Dr. Jones also um, served as an assistant professor at the Harvard School of Public Health from 1994 to 2000 and as medical officer of the Center of Disease Control and Prevention from 2000 to 2014. Next, Dr. Wisdom Powell. She is Associate Professor of Health Behavior at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill's Gilling School of Global Public Health. Dr. Powell is also Director of the UNC's Men's Health Research Lab. In 2011 to 2012, she was appointed by President Barack Obama to serve as a White House Fellow to the Under Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta. In this role, she served as Special Advisor on Military Mental Health. Her community-based research focuses on the role of modern racism and gender norms on African-American male health outcomes and health care inequities. She has published more than 35 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters. Additionally, she is an American Psychological Association minority, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Kaiser Permente Birch, Institute of African-American Research, and Ford Foundation Fellow, who received her PhD her master's in clinical psychology and master's of public health from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Go blue. <laughs> also, she served as chair of APA's work group on health disparities in boys and men's and co-chair of the health committee for President Obama's My Brother's Keeper initiative in Durham County, North Carolina. Last but certainly not least, Dr. John Rich is a professor of health management and policy at the Drexel University School of Public Health. He is also the co-director of the Center for Nonviolence and Justice at Drexel. Dr. Rich's work has focused on issues of urban violence and trauma, health disparities, and on the health of men of color. In 2006, Dr. Rich was granted a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. 
In awarding this distinction, the foundation cited his work to design new methods of health care that stretch across the boundaries of public health, education, and social services, and justice systems to engage young men in caring for themselves and their peers. Prior to joining Drexel University, Dr. Rich served as the medical director of the Boston Public Health Commission, where he led the city's initiative on men's health, cancer, cardiovascular health, and health disparities. As a primary care doctor at Boston Medical Center, he created the Young Men's Health Clinic and initiated the Boston's Health Crew, a program to train inner city young men and peer, as peer health educators. His book about urban violence titled Wrong Place, Wrong Time, Trauma and Violence in the Lives of Young Black Men has drawn critical acclaim. So first up, Dr. Jones. I am delighted to be here. This is actually my first STIM meeting, but I, I know lots of people who are members, and it's an opportunity. Um, this symposium on racial bias and social injustice, I have shortened to be on racism. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have a lot of words and we go around it and everything, okay. And actually, as the president of the American Public Health Association, uh, my presidential initiative is having our association launch a national campaign against racism. So in the 10 minutes that I was given today that we have stretched to 15, I'm going to speak very quickly. I'm going to define racism. I'm going to share with you um, an understanding of racism on three levels, including how it, on all of those levels, can impact what we see in terms of police violence and, and black men. And then also share another, illustrate that with my Gartner's Tale allegory and share another very quick allegory. Now, before I start, how many of you are familiar with my Gartner's Tale allegory? Please raise your hands. So it's really about a fourth, a third to a fourth. So I am going to tell it still. I'll tell it faster. For those of you all who haven't heard it before, this is not the full-blown version. Um, and for those who have heard it before, I want you to listen with different ears. Listen for the nuances in the storytelling so that you can tell it back, okay? But let's start with a definition of racism. So when I talk about racism, I'm clear that I'm talking about a system. I am not talking about an individual character flaw or a personal moral failing or even a psychiatric illness, as some people have suggested. I'm talking about a system of power and a system of doing what? It's a system of structuring opportunity and of assigning value. And on what basis is that opportunity structured? And on what basis is that value assigned? It's based on the social interpretation of how one looks, which is what we call race. We could have a long conversation there, but we won't. What are the, uh, <coughs> what are the impacts of that system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on so-called race? Well, when we do think or talk about racism at all in this country, we do finally understand that it unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities. But it doesn't take very long to recognize that every unfair disadvantage has its reciprocal unfair advantage, so that racism is also unfairly advantaging other individuals and communities. And that's the whole issue of unearned white privilege that we hardly ever talk about. But then there's a third, mostly un not even appreciated impact of racism, and that's how it saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. Many examples of that. Um, the fact that we don't vigorously invest in the full ex excellent education of all of our kids because the blinders of racism make us feel that there's no genius in the barrios or in the ghettos or on the reservations. The way that these same blinders make us complacent with the wholesale warehousing disproportionately of so many black and brown men in our prison system. The way that these blinders make us not understand the magnitude of the loss when there is time after time after time, again and again over centuries, and now in the past few years because of cell phones and dash camps, the loss of black and brown men and women to, to un fettered police violence without accountability is another example of that loss. For all of us day to day, the fact of health disparities and the fact that we don't understand that the eight to 10 year difference in life expectancy between black and brown men or black and white men and women, or, uh, that that is a loss to the nation. So I'm not gonna stay there long except to say that we need to call out all of these impacts of racism, but we really need a lot of media stories, data collection, conversations around our dinner tables about how racism saps the strength of the whole society. Now, though, how could it impact health broadly and also how could it be 
related to what we're uh, going to talk about today. So for that, I find it useful to think about three levels of racism, institutionalized, personally mediated, and internalized. I'm going to define each of these, very briefly give you some examples, and then illustrate them with my Gardner's Tale allegory. Institutionalized racism is the system, if you will, the constellation of structures, policies, practices, norms, and values that results in differential access to the goods, services, and opportunities of society by race. This is the kind of racism that doesn't require an identifiable perpetrator. This is the kind of racism that's been institutionalized in our laws and customs and background norms. It shows up in terms of material conditions as well as in terms of access to power. Examples include differential access to quality housing or equal educational opportunities or equal employment opportunities or even the same level of income at the same level of employment. Those things impact health. Differential access to medical facilities including linguistic access. Differential access to a clean environment. Differential access in terms of power to information, health information, or even information about our own, our own histories. Differential access to resources, capital resources, but also social networking resources, knowing somebody on the board. Differential access to power as voice in government, media, and the like. And I just want to quickly uh, point out, really, that that top bullet about housing, education, employment, and income, some people have said, Dr. Jones, you know, that's what we call social class. Why do you even have that on a slide about racism? Are you talking about racism, or are you really, really, really talking about social class? And it's an important question. I will answer it with the first part of my answer is the observation that it doesn't just so happen that people of color in this country are overrepresented in poverty while white people in this country are overrepresented in wealth. That is not a happenstance, and for each marginalized or stigmatized or oppressed group of color, there's been some initial historical insult. So for American Indians, it was the taking of the land and the near genocide and then the moving of the survivors to reserve lands, reservations, and then in some instances, something good was found under one reservation. Oops, you gotta pick them up and move them someplace else. I could go through a whole litany of different groups. I'll just end with the one that I usually end with, which is the kidnapping of West African people, right? and the importation of West African people across the Atlantic with tremendous loss of life in the Middle Passage. And then what I describe as the coerced usury of our unpaid labor for the survivors and their progeny, coerced usury of our unpaid labor for centuries to build this country. But then people get a little irked when I start talking like that. And they say, well, Dr. Jones, you know, you're talking about slavery, and we do understand that slavery was an unfortunate chapter in our nation's history, but Dr. Jones, the enslaved people were emancipated by 1865, and it is now 2016, so that makes it 151 years ago. So Dr. Jones, all else being equal, don't you think the impacts of slavery would have washed out by now? But the key phrase, of course, is all else being equal. And all else has not been equal since 1865, and all else still is not equal today. And there are what I describe as contemporary structural factors that are perpetuating each of these initial historical insults. And those are part of institutionalized racism. So when you ask me, am I talking about social class or racism, institutionalized racism explains why we even see an association, be association between social class and race. And the last thing I want to say on institutionalized racism is that it can be through acts of doing, acts of commission, as well as acts of not doing acts of omission, and very often institutionalized racism shows up as inaction in the face of need. Second level of racism, personally mediated racism, I define as differential assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intents of others by race, and then differential actions based on those assumptions. So that's what most people think of when they hear the word racism. Somebody did something to somebody. It includes the prejudice, the different idea, and the discrimination, the different action, and boom, here we go. Examples, police brutality. This is an old, old slide decades old now. I used to talk about, imagine you were pulled over for driving while black or driving while Latino and then interpreted as resisting arrest <clears throat> and hit upside the head or worse. You know, we heard one of our physician friends talking about that kind of experience. <clears throat> now we can, I can give you a litany of names. We could lift up in this room a litany of names. We could talk about Mike Brown or Eric Garner or Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, thank you, thank you. Um, you know, Sam DuBose, Sandra Bland, little baby Tamir Rice. We could talk about Trayvon Martin wasn't even a police officer. It was some self-appointed neighborhood watchman who thought that that young boy did not belong in that neighborhood and hunted him down and killed him. 
So police brutality is a huge part of personally mediated racism, but I tell you something else. The institutionalized piece of that is that when another police officer sees something go down, they will not tell on that. There's the code, the blue code of silence, which is an institutionalized aspect of that. And we need to, so it's not all in bad actors, right? It's a bad system, okay? Anyway, other examples of um, personally mediated racism, physician disrespect, shopkeeper vigilance. So physician disrespect, not getting full, I mean, not, not um, you know, a physician looks at a patient and thinks the patient can't afford, right, or wouldn't understand or wouldn't comply and so doesn't give them the full range of treatment options. Shopkeeper vigilance, waiter dis indifference, that's, you know, the everyday racism stuff, you know, the subtle communication of disrespect. Teacher devaluation can affect a child because if a teacher looks at a young child and thinks that child can't learn, and puts them off in the ADD track, that child will never even know their full potential, much less have the opportunity to develop to their full potential. All of these are like institutionalized in that they can be through acts of doing as well as acts of not doing. But even more important is to recognize that personally mediated racism can be unintentional as well as intentional. You do not have to have intended to do something racist to have had a racist impact. The third level of racism, internalized racism, I'm going to define today from the point of view of members of the stigmatized races as acceptance by members of the stigmatized races of negative messages about our own abilities and intrinsic worth. Of course, some of my anti-racism friends say, what about the internalized sense of entitlement that many white people walk around with? Isn't that also internalized racism? Indeed it is, not talking about it right here, right now. How can this impact health? Well, self-devaluation, feeling maybe I'm really not as good as feeling maybe I shouldn't try to graduate from high school or apply to that college or apply for that job or try to live in that neighborhood. It even turns into fratricide, black on black or Latino on Latino crime, because if you don't value yourself, you won't value somebody who looks similar to you and you would just as soon off them as not. White man's ice is colder syndrome, that phraseology came from my parents' generation. What it meant then, and what it still means for many people of color is say, you're black and you need a doctor, you might actually go look for a white doctor. Or if you needed a lawyer, you might seek out a white lawyer. In fact, if your water were warm, you might go way down the street to get the white man's ice over the black man's ice, deeply believing that the white man's ice is colder, deeply internalizing the myth of white superiority. Internalized racism shows up as resignation, helplessness, hopelessness. We often see it in our clinical practices as self-destructive health behaviors, right? It also turns into not registering to vote or not voting even if you are registered. And, you know, come on, people, all hands on deck now, you know. <laughs> 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 And really, internalized racism is about members of stigmatized races accepting the limitations to our own full humanity of the box into which we've been placed. So now I'm very quickly going to illustrate these levels of racism with one of my allegories, one of my teaching stories, most of which are based on something I've seen with my own real eyes. So I'm going to tell you very briefly what I saw with my own real eyes, then I'll make it a story about racism. Husband and I, newly married, moved back to Baltimore. I'm going to finish my PhD. We buy our first freestanding house, cute little house. Big wraparound porch, flower boxes all on the porch. Bought the house in October, not even thinking about planting anything. But when spring came, already going to run out, plant our marigolds. We run out with our seeds, and we see that some of the boxes have dirt in them, but some of the boxes are empty. So my husband goes down to the gardening store. He hauls big old bags of potting soil back. We fill up the empty boxes, and then we plant equal numbers of marigold seeds in all of the boxes. We water them. Three weeks later, I'm walking out of my front door onto my porch, and I stopped in my tracks. Because when I looked at those flower boxes, it looked to me like we had planted completely different species in some boxes versus the others. Because some of the boxes were full of plants, and they were tall, vigorous-looking plants. And other boxes just had a few plants in them. And they were scrawny and scraggly-looking. And then I realized what had happened. That potting soil was rich, fertile soil. So that every single seed planted in the potting soil had sprouted. The strong seed had grown tall and vigorous. Even the weak seed had made it halfway up. That old soil that we had found there turned out to be poor rocky soil. So the weak seed had died. The strong seed had to struggle just to make it to a middling height. And some of you guys are nodding. So there are gardeners in this room who have composted half of your garden, say. And you've seen this image. It's about the importance of the soil, the importance of the environment. But now I'm going to make it a story about racism by introducing a gardener. And this gardener 
has two flower boxes, one which she knows to have rich, fertile soil, and one which she knows to have poor, rocky soil. And she has seed for the same kind of flowers, except some of the seed is going to produce pink blossoms, and some of the seed is going to produce red blossoms, and the gardener prefers red over pink. So what does she do? She takes the red seed and puts it in the rich, fertile soil, and the pink seed in the poor, rocky soil, and three weeks later, she sees in her boxes what I saw in mine. In that rich, fertile soil, all of the red seed has sprouted. Strong red seed grows tall and vigorous. The weak red seed at least makes it halfway up. In that poor rocky soil, the weak pink seed dies. Here comes a strong pink seed struggling to make it to a middling height. And then in those flower boxes, those flowers go to seed. And the next year, same thing happens. And then those flowers go to seed. And year after year after year after year, the same thing happens until finally, about 10 years later, Gardner's looking at her flower boxes and she says, you know, I was right to prefer red over pink. So we interrupt the story there to say the first part of the story is how institutionalized racism works. You had the initial historical insult of the separation of the seed into the two types of soil. You had the contemporary structural factors of the flower boxes, keeping the soil separate, and through inaction in the face of need, perpetuation of the inequity. Let's pick the story back up, where it's personally mediated racism. Where Gardner looks over at red, loves red, looks over at pink and says, oh, those flowers sure are scrawny as scraggly, so she plucks off the pink blossoms before they can even go to seed, police brutality. Or she might notice that a pink seed is blown into the rich fertile soil and so she plucks it out, which is some of the anti-affirmative action stuff that goes on. And where would internalized racism be in the garden? Well, red flowers just living their lives, enjoying being red, many of them either not understanding or acknowledging that they're benefiting from enriched soil, pink flowers looking over at red thinking red is mighty fine and wishing with all their hearts that they too could be red. And here come the bees. And the bees are minding their own business you know, collecting nectar, but pollinating at the same time. So here comes a bee into one of the pink flowers and then into an, another pink flower and then to this pink flower. This flower is like, get away from me, bee. Don't bring me any of that pink pollen. I prefer the red because the pink flower has internalized that red is better than pink. So now the question arises, what do we do to set things right in this garden? Well, we could start by addressing the internalized racism. So we can go over to the pink flowers and we can say, Pink is beautiful, power to the pink. And that is, <laughs> that is an important intervention, not making light. But if that's all we do, it's not going to change the situation in which the pink flowers find themselves. So you say, OK, let's address the personally mediated racism. So let's have a conversation with the gardener. Or better yet, let's have a workplace multicultural workshop for the gardener. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. So we have our workshop. In the workshop, we say, dear gardener, would you please stop plucking those pink flowers? And maybe she will, and maybe she won't. But even if she does, it's still not going to change the situation in which the pink flowers find themselves. I think that if you really want to set things right in the garden, you must address the institutionalized racism. You have to either break down the boxes and mix up the soil, or if you want to keep separate boxes, that's all right too, although it makes it easier for the gardener to continue segregating resources going forward. But if you keep separate boxes, it means you need to enrich that poor rocky soil until it's as rich as the rich fertile soil. And when you do, the pink flowers will flourish. They'll be looking beautiful, grand, and glorious. And in that intervention, you'll have also addressed the internalized racism. Pink's not going to be looking over at red, thinking red is better. And in that intervention, you may also address the personally mediated racism. The original gardener may have to go to her grave preferring red over pink. But the ch her children who grow up and see the flowers equally beautiful would be less likely to have that kind of attitude. So very quickly, that was to illustrate those three levels of racism and to suggest that we have to at least address the institutionalized. Good if we address all the levels at the same time, but at least address the institutionalized and the other levels may take care of themselves. Okay, I'm not even going to look and see how much more time I have. Um, I'm just going to say, <laughs> there's, I just, oh no! Okay, I'm going to wrap up in three minutes, okay? Okay, so, so I, here's a question that we, didn't, um, that we didn't even raise yet, which is who's the gardener? After all, it's the one that I gave the power to decide, power to act, control of resources, which in my mind are the elements of self-determination. Government's a huge part of the gardener, but not the only part. So media, foundations, corporations, even, even communities to the extent that they have self-determination, but whoever the gar gardener is, it's dangerous when the gardener is, with, is allied with one group. I painted her red, that's why she prefers red over pink. And it's also dangerous when she's not concerned with equity, right? When she can look at her flower boxes and think that her garden is beautiful, thank you, because she's not even counting the pink flowers as part of the garden. And our challenge is what to do about the gardener. Do we make the gardener striped, poke it 
dotted fuchsia? Do the pink flowers have to grow or recruit their own gardener? Lots of questions that can come out. I will have to share them during the Q&A. But here's the last thing I want to say. This is another allegory that probably most of you have not seen. This one was sparked by my experience uh, when I was a medical student, studying late with some friends in the apartment, we got hungry, no food in the apartment, we decide we're going to go into town and get something to eat. So we go into town, we find a restaurant, we sit down, menus are presented, we order our food, food is served, and we are eating, here we are. And it's not an exciting story yet, but you know, as I sat there eating with my friends, I looked up and I noticed a sign. And the sign was a profound revelation to me about racism. So you're wondering, like, what did the sign say? Well, the sign said open. That's all it said. But you know what? Here I was, sitting at the table of opportunity, eating. I see a sign that says open, and I could have assumed that other hungry people could walk and sit down and eat the same way I had, except I knew something about the two-sided nature of those signs, and I realized that, in fact, now the restaurant was closed due to the hour, and that hungry people just a few feet away from me but on the other side of that sign would not be able to come and sit down and eat. And then I understood how racism structures open, closed signs in our society, how racism structures a dual reality. And for those who are inside the restaurant, sitting at the table of opportunity, eating, and they see a sign that says open, they don't even know there's a two-sided sign going on. In fact, it's difficult for any of us to recognize a system of inequity that privileges us. It is difficult for men to recognize male privilege and sexism. It is difficult for white Americans to recognize white privilege and racism. It is difficult for all Americans to recognize our American privilege in the global context, except we got a little hint of it with Ebola. But for those who are on the outside, well, we did, right? But those on the outside are very well aware of the two-sided nature of the sign because it proclaims close to them, but they can look through the window and see people inside eating. So back inside, to those who say, is there really a two-sided sign? Does racism really exist? I say, I know it's hard to know that when you only see open. In fact, that's part of your privilege not to have to know, but once you do know, you can choose to act. So it's not a scary thing, it's an empowering thing. It doesn't compel you to act, but it equips you to act. And if you care anything about the people on the other side of the sign, then you could even talk to the restaurant owner and you could say, why don't you open the restaurant again? If there are hungry people outside, you'll make more money and oh, the conversations we can have. Or maybe you'll push food out the door or break down the glass or tear down the sign, but whatever you do, you wouldn't be just sitting there saying, huh, wonder why those people don't just come on in and sit down and eat, because you'll understand something about the two-sided nature of the sign. So I look forward to our discussions after the next two panelists. Thank you very much. So of course, as you all have witnessed, it is a really tough act uh, to follow <laughs> Kamara. <laughs> Let me just say that publicly and up front and full disclosure, but I'm so always inspired every time I hear her, and she set a really nice um, context for some of the comments and remarks I'm going to make. And I want to start this presentation out by um, making a clear acknowledgement about the, what I um, see as my um, positioning and motivation for being in this space. I've been working um, on the health of boys and men of color um, for my whole career. And oftentimes the question is, um, what is a woman of color um, doing in this space? And if, it's, if that's not the explicit question, it's the implicit one. So I'll just give you that detail right up front so we can be done with that part of the conversation. Um, one of the reasons um, this work is so compelling and important to me is because I am the granddaughter of an African-American male Korean War veteran who died at the age of 51 from a preventable cancer, but also had to leave Alabama in the middle of the night to escape a potential lynching. And in so doing, severed the ties between his family and the generations that followed him. And so when he died, all of the family history went to the grave with him. And so that this work for me is all really about honoring his legacy and preventing other families and children from losing the men and boys that they love before they've reached their fullest potential. And it is with that energy and with the energy of my grandfather that I talk about this work. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the psychophysiological consequences of being exposed to racism on a day-to-day -day basis. And before we start this out, I think it's important to root this conversation in a very unfortunate reality. On July 17, 2014, the world watched as Eric Garner um, died violently at the hands of Staten Island police officers. 
What was most compelling about this um, assault on his humanity in life was the number of times he pleaded for support. He said no less than 10 times that he could not breathe, and yet the world and everyone around him watched while he was violently eliminated. And the reason I bring up this analogy of not being able to breathe is because I think it centers the, our understanding around the mere fact that racism is like carbon monoxide. It is odorless, it is invisible, difficult to detect, but is equally as noxious and harmful. The other thing I want us to, to sort of meditate on today is the impact of these kinds of losses to the families, communities, and women and children, like my mother, her siblings, my nieces and nephews, my sisters and brothers. When black men die too soon, there is a, there is a uh, domino effect on the communities, families around them. And ultimately, as Kamara pointed out, on our nation and our capacity to compete in a global marketplace. All of this um, uh, loss of life happens against a really unfortunate epidemiologic fact. And that is, despite all of the gains that we've made in life expectancy and closing the sex differences gap, that black men st still live the shortest lives of all individuals in our society. And we know that those differences are not uh, purely epigenetic, and they are not biologically rooted entirely. Because if they were, then you would see the same pattern of differences in mortality across men from all other race sex groups. But that's not the case. These differences are socially determined. And we are starting to see a national discourse around this very um, evident fact. And um, the New York Times published an article about the 1.5 million missing black men in America. And I, like many others, watching this news unfold had several questions. Are they missing? Because missing implies that they're ducking behind bushes and hiding out, that there's been a search party launch, launched on their behalf, that there is a series of milk carton campaigns being erected in their honor. And I would say that the real truth here is that they're not missing. They're perhaps forgotten, or even more um, pr uh, pronounced, they're probably stolen, and stolen by a number of preventable conditions. Many black men, as we know, are missing because of higher death rates from chronic diseases, but many more are missing because of disproportionate exposure to racism. As evidence in lots of data that we're seeing emerge, including the data from New York City that showed a disproportionate number of stop and frisks among Latino and, and African American men, and also more recent evidence published in PLAS that suggested over the past 50 years, black men have faced significantly greater risk of being killed by police than white men. And so in case you are wondering what this all means in the context of the psychobiological um, context of racism exposure for black men, let me make it plain. Racial profiling um, as an extension of, as an example of everyday racism is a, presents a persistent threat to black males' sense of safety, belonging, and mortality. And nothing makes that more clear than the words of um, George Zimmerman himself, um, who took it upon himself, as Kamara has pointed out, to uh, sur surveil this young man as he navigated a neighborhood, holding Skittles and pop. And if that's not enough to make you wonder about this re unfortunate reality, then there are other news examples, other stories of black men talking about feeling threatened day to day as they move about their lives, walking around in communities. One black man said that every time I see a police officer, I get a cold chill. Even if, even if I needed one, I wouldn't call one. So it's important for us to understand everyday racism as presenting um, a persistent sense of threat and creating what theorists call a threat-based agonic context. So what does that mean? That means that a, there is a context that individuals in, in, exist in from day to day that persistently chips away at their humanity little by little. And when we're talking about everyday racism, we're talking, again, probably more about personally mediated racism, but that is made possible by the structural racism that surrounds us all. These are brief, subtle, ambiguous, commonplace, verbal or behavioral indignities, sometimes called microaggressions, microassaults, or microinvalidations. And we know that everyday racism has a significant impact, not just on how, pe how people navigate their context, but how they engage systems. So in some of the early research that I've conducted, we found that 
Um, unlike what the common folklore was, black men weren't mistrusting medical organizations simply because of incidents that happened in Tuskegee. They actually had very little knowledge of the, of the real facts of that situation. But what they were resisting medical organizations um, around or because of, it was because of everyday racism, the kind of racism that has a carryover effect, as we were taught in, uh, by unequal treatment, into um, healthcare systems. It's pretty rational to imagine that if you're being discriminated against just walking to the store, trying to hail a cab in New York City and getting service, that it's probably more likely that you will be discriminated against in a healthcare situation. You can't get more vulnerable than when you are in that backless gown. And we've also found that it's really important as we think about racism to think about how racism gets filtered into people's consciousness. We know that when people are experiencing racism, it presents an assault to different aspects of their identity. Um, for some folks, the, that assault shows up as sexism or as discrimination against one's gender. And in other cases, it shows up as a discrimination against other aspects of their humanity and identity. But for black men, it's important for us to bring into this conversation what racism does to their sense of manhood. So in my work, we have looked carefully at the interdigitation between exposure to discrimination and black men's sense of what it means to be a man in the world. And this is critically important because as men appraise stressful race-related situations, they have to make a decision about how they're going to respond in the moment and from situation to situation. And masculinity matters in this case because men are told that to be a man about things, they need to be strong, tough, silent, and stoic and that men are, are, are socialized to display toughness no matter what, in, um, especially in situations where stress is heightened. And that if we don't understand this, then we won't understand why it is that the internalization of discrimination can sometimes lead to harmful and, most, and negative health outcomes. So I'm just gonna give you a quick primer on masculinity for those of you who are not um, familiar with the way that I'm talking about it. I'm not talking about masculinity as a personality characteristic or as biological sex, I'm talking about the kind and norms that we all breathe in. Probably if I were to ask everyone in this room, you probably have had a moment when either you have or you've been on a playground and observed some young um, male child falling down on the playground or in, during rough play and someone saying to him, what? Boys don't, Boys don't cry, walk it off, take it like a man. And those kinds of norms, while they may be situationally helpful, if habitually internalized and deployed, can be harmful to men's health. So there are two kinds of norms that I think are particularly important when we're thinking about everyday racism and its interdigitation in the lives of black men. The first is self-reliance. This norm that encourages men to take on the world by themselves, to be um, unmitigated in their um, relentless pursuit of self-reliance and autonomy. And the norms around emotionality that encourage men to stuff down emotion, to suppress those things that are discouraging or stressful. These two norms are play in, uh, important roles in our understanding of how racism gets embodied by black men and boys. We know, for example, from research that we've conducted that racism also works in tandem with everyday, uh, with masculinity norms to diminish black men's help-seeking motivations. So it's not just about uh, masculinity, it is about how masculinity and racism both interact. Because guess what? If you are experiencing discrimination and you believe that you should shut down those emotions and suppress them habitually, time after time, there's going to be a, an impact both on your physiology, on your psychology, and on your way, your transactions, and your um, way of moving about the world. Everyday racism presents, to make it plain, a challenge to black masculinity. It's not a challenge that's always met with defiance or anger, although anger is a legitimate response to social injustice. Um, but it also is met with activism, as we've seen by the 1968 sanitation white workers strike. Black men don't just get angry, they get moving also. But what we haven't had, I think, which is really critically important, is a really deep conversation about the intrapsychic consequences of black men the interior lives of black men. What does it mean to be chronically exposed to a stressor that diminishes your humanity? In every situation almost, where that there's this constant need for you to prove that you're not the dangerous guy, that perhaps you have on a hoodie because you're cold, or um, you haven't combed your hair that day, or whatever your reason, that, that have to, to mount that, that um, 
uh, impression management strategy on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, when we ask black men themselves, this is what they tell us. Racism has caused many of us to believe that we don't count and that our needs are not important. Racism has forced a lot of black men to sit on top of their pain and to feel as if there are very few outlets to share their feelings of frustration with the system. So that in fact, that, that, that tendency towards suppression and emotional stoicism is even more pronounced among marginalized men. And it causes some black men to cry in the dark. Now there's a lot of data to suggest that depression is less um, prevalent among men. Um, we see this gender paradox in mental health where we, we see men reporting less depression but having higher rates of suicide. And I would, I would venture to guess that that paradox is present because men don't talk about what they're feeling. They act on those feelings in ways that are harmful and violent to themselves and others. And we have done some research around trying to figure out what happens to black men when they both experience a lot of discrimination or racism and then believe that they should suppress those emotions. Not surprisingly, we find that the association between everyday racism exposure and depression among black men is more pronounced among men who believe that they should, in fact, shut down, stuff down, and suppress emotion. We also know that everyday racism has a significant impact on the health disparities and inequities that we see. And we've been doing some theorizing around this. Now, if I were teaching a psychology um, seminar, I might do this in a slower fashion, but I'm going to give you the fast version of how this exposure happens and what happens to set in motion this process that can put black men at greater risk for health inequities. The first thing is the everyday racism exposure. Now, that d exposure varies based on personal characteristics. One's age, when it's internalization of dominant masculinity ideologies. And then when that happens, individuals have to first decide, how meaningful is this to me? They have to appraise that um, exposure as something significant. Because if it's not significant or meaningful, there, there's not going to be as many consequences. So after this, if the event is not meaningfully relevant, no stress. We just ignore that. If it is meaningfully relevant or threatening to ask one aspect of someone's humanity that's critical or central to them, like masculinity, then there's a secondary appraisal. They have to then decide, what am I going to do about it? Do I have the ability and resources to cope successfully with these experiences? If yes, then no positive, no effect. One could even experience that as a positive stress. But if, there's, if it's no, then they can have a psychological response that can present itself as depressed mood, for example, as anxiety. And when that happens, then individuals would then have to decide what kind of emotion regulation strategy they're going to use. And this is the area in which I do my work. I try to understand what are the in the moment affect regulation strategies that black men use so that we can understand what the consequences of those strategies are for different kinds of behavioral responses that set up the health inequities that we see. Now this doesn't mean that we shouldn't look at the structure because the structure has to change. Um, you can't, if all the fish in the water are dying, you, you can't just look at the fish, right? You gotta change, change the water. But it's also important for us to think about place and context, because these experiences happened just as Eric Garner's experience happened, just as Trayvon Martin's experience happened in places where men live, work, play, pray, and get health care. And so it's important for us to understand that in some context that this masculinity cascade that we see is more pronounced and prevalent and more likely to occur. So imagine if you're living in a neighborhood like Chicago where there's high violence, alcohol, and drug activity all around you. Sheer existence in that neighborhood requires you to man up in ways that many of us could not imagine. So asking young men to take on and off that mask and that, that cape may be more difficult for those, for those men. And I want to just share with you something that I thought was really um, uh, sort of illustrative of this particular kind of um, existence. Now, this comes from ta Coates. Um, his amazing book, Between the World and Me. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. But he talks about this. He says, you know, I would come out of the house, turn on the Flatbush Avenue, and my face would tighten like a Mexican wrestler's mask. My eyes would dart from corner to corner, corner my arms loose, limber, and ready. This need to be always on guard was an unmeasured expenditure of energy and slow siphoning of the essence. It contributed to the fast breakdown of our bodies. And so this work has taken me from barbershops 
to car washes, to nightclubs, to like wherever black men congregate, you'll find me there with a clipboard or, or a tablet. <laughs> I disrupt spaces all the time. And, um, but also, more recently, we're doing work in neighborhoods. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about where I think this work is headed and where there's some opportunity for intervention, um, both at the structural level and also at the individual level. So we're now conducting a, a NIDA-funded study um, a, a, uh, affectionately called MANHOODS, long acronym, as psychologists often are capable of producing. Um, we're doing this um, work in Durham neighborhoods where nearly half of the black men are under the ages of 29. We're focusing on a period of development where we know that black men are at greater risk for exposure to racism of the kind that I described, and that's between 18 to 29 when men are making that swift transition to adulthood. We're doing this in Durham also because we know that 53% of the youth there have a substance abuse related problem, and we're trying to understand how ecologic contexts potentiate those risk taking behaviors. And we know that there's some need because of the greater number of deaths among black men because of substance abuse related issues. This is just a really broad overview of our strategy. We're really looking at um, investigating the exposures to violence, alcohol, and drug activity to see whether or not existence in those neighborhoods require men to man up in particular ways. But then we're using ecological momentary assessment technology, which is a digital diary technology where we're getting moment to moment exposure to racial profiling and men's in the moment affect regulation strategy with the end game being not to just study this as an esoteric matter of fact, but to intervene on those processes through ecological momentary intervention techniques. And this is just a little bit about how we're assessing neighborhood um, environments. There is a need to move beyond census data when we're trying to understand how racial profiling unfolds. We can't just look at the SES of a neighborhood from a uh, balcony view. We need to actually get on the ground and look around and see what's happening. So we're using an environmental typology instrument that we developed an app for to be able to assess all of the characteristics in these neighborhoods that we described uh, on the slide. In the next steps, we're going to be looking at these things. We're going to be um, exploring their linkages to, uh, between local and, and opportunities for local and national policy initiatives. One way that I'm doing that in, uh, most immediately is by working on my Brother's Keeper initiative, where we are moving beyond the body cam discussion. OK, I'll just take a deep breath, because I have to every time I hear uh, um, conversations about the utility of body cams when people can turn them on and off. But we actually are thinking about ways that we can intervene, not just on the side of black men, but on the police officers who have also um, uh, breathed in the carbon monoxide that we know uh, makes racism um, uh, proliferate. So before I end, I just want to leave on these words um, of Leslie McSpadden, who's the mother of Michael Brown. Because if you think for a moment that this work is just about the health of boys and men, um, and, and you know, some folks take me to task on that issue, um, are we just creating more opportunities and initiatives that are going to further the, the, the power of men in the world? Well, I want you to think about Leslie McSpadden's comment and about the, the statements I made about the intergeneral impacts of, uh, generational impacts of the loss of my grandfather on my own life. That when men and boys die and are taken out by systems of inequality, police brutality, racial profiling, and injustice, that we are all impacted. And if you can think of nothing else or no other reason to engage in this work, think of them as an extension of you. But I like to think of this work as an opportunity for me to display what is truly a radical love for those who are underserved and for the boys and men of color who are going to be the future labor force of our nation. Thank you. So thank you to my colleagues for, for those dynamic presentations that really I hope to build on in this conversation. And I suppose that my, my thinking about this and my work has been about hearing the voices of young people who are affected by violence and racism and trauma. And so I want to take a moment and, and share with you some of those voices and, and their insights. But I want to start by acknowledging that um, violence against black men is not new. So if you remember Rodney King in 1991, Again, the officers who beat him so brutally were acquitted. You may remember Abner Luima, who was uh, brutally beaten and sodomized by the police. Um, there were individuals who were uh, convicted and sentenced for that, uh, but he um, suffered greatly. And then Amadou Diallo, 
In 1999, shot 41 times, the officers who shot him were acquitted. And you may remember Sean Bell, the bridegroom who was shot 50 times, and again, the officers who shot him were acquitted. And so it's not, and that was in 2006, so it is implausible that between 2006 and 2012, when Trayvon Martin was killed, that there was no police violence happening, right? So why, why now are we believing it? And I believe it's because we had to see it with our own eyes. That the words of young people that were coming out of their mouths were, were insufficient for us to give them credibility. But now that we had cell phone cameras, and so I think we should acknowledge um, our lapse in that area, but also to recognize that much of the violence at the hands of the police that affects young people is um, not subtle to them, but it is less dramatic often than the types of high profile violence that we see. And so I'd like to share with you the words of a young man who was shot in Roxbury. And he told me the story about what happened when the police came. And as you know, the police are often the first ones on the scene of an injury. He says this, oh man, it was rough making it there. The cops came in the house. Who shot you? Who shot you? I'm like, I don't know. Then they just put me on a stretcher, took me down two flights of stairs, put me in an ambulance. Then he came onto the ambulance and said it again. Jimmy, you got shot six times, man. You ain't gonna make it. You're gonna die. Who shot you? Jimmy says, he's sitting up there saying it, and I know I've been shot six times, so I'm thinking I'm not gonna make it either. So I'm like, damn. He's like, who shot you, Jimmy? Who shot you? Come on, man, you ain't gonna make it. I'm like, man, I do not know who shot me. I'm sitting up here bleeding to death. Could you all take me to the hospital, please? So this is what happens in the moments before this young man rolls through the doors of our institutions. So if he's combative, if he's argumentative, if he is frightened, if he is disoriented, well, do we know what happened to him before he came in? And so there's an impact, there's a, there's a collision course that sometimes the actions of the police have with our own work. Another example, a young man who was shot when another young man tried to rob him of his chain. He said, he's talking about when he's lying on the ground, I really thought I was going to die, I really did. Because, and then the cop wasn't even doing me no favor, no help or nothing. They wouldn't let my man touch me, nothing. They was like, leave him alone, don't touch him. Then he kept saying, don't do nothing stupid like die. And I'm looking at this cop like, what? He's like, don't do nothing stupid like die. This kind of language aimed at young people seems ridiculous, off the hook, the kind of thing that we wouldn't expect to be directed at us. But it does show that at the point where these young people are dehumanized, almost any act against them seems doable. And I think that is the condition where we have young men of color in particular, where they're almost not viewed in human eyes. So this young man now talks about what happened when he got to the hospital. Because I remember them taking the x-rays when I was shot. I was bleeding. I was heated. It was hurting. They didn't even go right to surgery right away. They took mad x-rays. Five, like five doctors was there, all of them, pushing all over my stomach. Then they brought me to the operating room. They put that thing on my face, and it felt like they were smothering me. So the animus that is in the street comes in, and I think even our interactions with these young people are tinged by what's happened to them before. And to be honest, our interactions with them are often tinged with our own bias as well, right? So you may have seen a video that went viral um, perhaps a year ago. It happened in Philadelphia. And a young guy was with his, um, was getting on the train and he got into some sort of conflict with the ticket taker because he said that the machine sort of ate his money as he went in. And the police officers were called and met the train and stopped it. Did anybody see the viral video of this? So here what you, what you can see, this is taken from the SEPTA, the, the transportation system um, camera, is that the officer has put his his hands around this young person's neck. This is over a fair, 225 in Philadelphia. What you now see is that he was actually holding a child. 
the police officer has, in, in this moment, is, is without regard to this little girl that's in his arms, has now is, has had his hands around this young person's neck. And then as often happens now, a young person on the train pulled out his, um, his cell phone and took photos of it. And this spilled out onto the, uh, the platform where people are saying, let the daughter, give him the daughter. Now, now think about this. Um, we know more and more about the impacts of adversity and trauma on children. So while this young man is suffering these effects, his child is also suffering that trauma. Now, the head of SEPTA, when interviewed, said, oh, we, can't, we can't be doing this. We can't be, you know, roughing up children. He said that the police officer believed that if he didn't act, he would have been disciplined. Now, two points about this. You might have said, well, that's a black police officer. So it can't be racism. Black police officer is doing something to a black man. That's not racism. But then you hear that the police officer thought he would be disciplined. That is institutional racism. The system is designed to make these things happen. And so to our colleagues, my colleagues' points that were made earlier, this is really an issue of racism and how it plays out in the world. A young man talking about this says, it's actually kind of sad because you know the police is people we're supposed to look to for help. And it's like the power that one thinks he has over another man. That's not cool. They're supposed to help us. They're supposed to protect us. We're supposed to look to them for help. But they the ones, you know, that's helping destroy. That's the crazy part. And remember that young men of color, young African American men, are the most likely to be victimized of all populations. So they're actually the ones who need the police the most. But they acknowledge that the police are likely to be the ones victimizing them as well. Now, um, Sarah Brain at Princeton has written about what she calls system avoidance. And what she's found is that individuals who have had exposure to the criminal justice system then begin to avoid systems that keep formal records, such as the medical. So, epic, right? So you're typing in <laughs> information. When they see that happening, they, they tend to avoid those systems because they believe that these systems are connected in a way that, that adds to their surveillance. So medical, financial, labor market, and educational. Now those may look familiar as very much related to the social determinants of health, right? So if your exposures to the police cut you off from what we know are things that are important to population health, then the police and health are connected in very specific ways, and institutional racism is the way in which they're connected. Now, how does this relate to trauma? One of the things we've found in our work is certainly that a number, many young people who have been victims of violence suffer from post-traumatic stress in the aftermath. Now, because we in the medical system do not tend to acknowledge that, counsel about it, treat it. These young people are left to their own devices. Often that means they smoke weed. And that that is a way that they self-treat, lacking access to primary care or someone to give them sleep medications or talk to them. Well, what happens if you smoke weed? You're cut off from legitimate employment, even low-skill jobs. And if you're on probation, you're going back to jail. So this arc is one in which the medical racism and lack of attention is forcing or feeding the pipeline of mass incarceration. Indirectly, you might say, but in many ways it's quite direct. On the other hand, if young people do not trust the police and they're highly hyper-aroused as a result of post-traumatic stress, well, they often turn to weapons and they'll tell you to protect themselves, and sometimes with logical reasons. Well, we know that the presence of a firearm, post-traumatic stress, likely to end up in jail or dead. So that's the criminal justice arc leading to this mass incarceration outcome. So how do we think about this? What are our approaches? What are the implications? Well, first, we have got to take on police institutional racism. Now, you may know that the police system has deep roots in the plantation slavery 
uh, um, system that existed to return runaway slaves to their owners. And in fact, William Bratton, who's now the police superintendent in New York, said in a speech last year, slavery, our country's original sin, sat on a foundation codified by laws enforced by police and slave catchers. And in fact, Connie Rice, who wrote a book, um, she's a civil rights lawyer in Los Angeles who wrote a book called Power Concedes Nothing, has talked in depth and actually introduced William Bratton to the fact that the modern police badge is really modeled on the plantation police badge. Google this sometimes, it's, it's stunning. So we, we know that there's this embedded and historical link to institutional racism. But it actually parallels, I would say, medical institutional racism, separation. And I think so we need this whole system examination. Because for many of these young people, they just avoid the police. And they don't have frequent interactions with them. But every system that they interact with is a traumatizing one. Every system, when you go to court, if you're walking down the street, the police, when you go to get medical care, it's often quite traumatizing. The ultimate cost in terms of lives from institutional racism in medicine may far exceed that from direct violence at the hands of the police, although they work in tandem and together. So I think we can reject the idea that these are just bad apples, bad, a few bad cops, a few bad doctors delivering a particular type of care. And we know that racism is the anchor for these interlocking systems of privilege and oppression. So there's something about being black and young and poor and male that is greater than the, than the sum of its parts, but leads to this dehumanized stereotype. And to my colleague's point, racism is the, is the, is the foundation of that. And obviously, many of these situations like poverty spring from that. In this process, we certainly have to name white privilege. We have to be able to talk about that in hospitals, in medical schools, as we're teaching. And other forms of unearned privilege as well. It's important that we get there. But let me give an example about something that was prominent in the news after these shootings. People were saying, well, what is it that black parents need to sit down and talk to their kids about? Right? It's really important. People need to know. Well, on the other hand, you'd ask, well, what is it that white parents need to talk to their children about? Do they need to help their children understand that you're getting an, a little bit of an advantage in this world? While the world is less safe because of the police for black men, it may be a little safer for you, right? It may be that you're getting opportunities simply because of who you are or how you look that young people aren't getting. What is their role in intervening in those circumstances? So the idea that this is a problem that young black people and their families have to solve, I reject. But it's true, I think, that when we think about privilege, we realize that in these systems, not only are young black people less safe, but it may be that young white people are a little bit safer. In the same way in the healthcare system, it may be that people of color get worse care, but it is also true that white people get better care, right? So it's not simply, do you see what I'm saying? The difference isn't this is what's, this is the normal and we're trying to bring people up to the normal, rather there's a, there's a gulf here. And acknowledging that is not as contentious, I think, as it often seems in various settings. I think we can understand privilege. We, we should understand male privilege as well and we should be able to speak to that. But we have a role to play. I think we have to acknowledge the trauma and the pain and the stories of our patients, ask about their experiences at the hands of the police, ask about their experiences in other places in the healthcare system, but also acknowledge the roles that our own systems are playing and to the extent that we can work to undo those structures of internalized racism. And so we at the Boston Public Health Commission and many others have leaned on undoing racism training delivered by folks like the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. If we're, not, if we're just standing there waiting for this to go away, it's not really going to go away. I know my colleague, I heard her speak on Monday. We could try and wait for a whole bunch of people like the gardener to die off. But <laughs> <laughs> the, pr <laughs> the problem is that, that some of you know, our medical students may get trained in 
implicit association training, and then, but you know, you get into residency, and then your attendings have a particular view, and you really, it's hard to sustain this new way of thinking. And then we can advocate for change. I, I truly believe that we have a strong voice as providers. I think that we can join together. I think in some cases the remedies um, are us banding together with other sectors, like the legal system. Um, Connie Rice sued a lot of folks when, you, when she saw inequities at the hands of the police. I sometimes wonder whether we don't have some of those same remedies at our disposal that are really aimed at systems rather than individuals. Because again, as pointed out, we cannot put our faith in body cameras any more than we could put our faith in a camera hung around the neck of every primary care physician or cardiologist or nephrologist to make sure that the care, that nobody got any care that was, was not um, up to snuff. Rather, we have to continue to advocate that systems take a look at themselves and um, in that process, engage the communities around in making for change. So with that, I hope to take us to the conversation that all of you have a lot to add to. Uh, we're going to open this um, period for question and answers. Um, if, you all, if any of you all have any questions for our, our panelists, please um, just form a line there. Don't all rush at once. <laughs> um, and while we're, um, oh, I just want to ask a question. And can you um, identify yourself in your institution? Uh, so I'm Preston Reynolds from the University of Virginia. Uh, and first of all, I want to thank you. Not only, I'm sure I'm speaking for myself, but everyone else from this room for putting together a really moving session. Uh, so, Dr. Jones, thank you. You know, we've talked earlier, I use your work in my class. And I just read final papers of my students and they're referring to your work in their essays. <laughs> so the message is getting out at many levels. Um, I took on the opportunity to be the medical director of our local jail. And so I see the inmates that come in and sometimes I find myself almost wanting to weep by the stories that I hear from these often black men. Um, now our jail is the only jail in Virginia that's never had a lawsuit against it. The common word on the street is if you want to get good mental health, good dental health, good medical care, get arrested. Because you'll get in the jail and you'll get what you need. But I think this is an opportunity to work behind the doors to create models of care that address the depression, the PTSD, the trauma, the demoralization that these men experience. So I'm really asking for help in creating a kind of intervention that could be replicated in a setting where there's also a very, very receptive group of leaders. The flip side of that is I'm a primary care physician in a clinic and I see the men when they come out and now I'm their primary care provider. And sometimes I have to remind them that being a black man in the South is still a very, very brutalizing and hard experience. And I hear them weep in my clinic as they share those same stories. So there's a door from the clinic to the jail to the clinic to the jail that there's a multiple points of intervention, but I'm asking really for help to put together something that at least behind the door might be able to heal some of these wounds. I'd like to go first. Um, thank you for that question, but as you were saying it, I was like, yes, maybe they're getting better medical care even at the level it is inside, but, but the real intervention would be to get jobs for them when they get out. It, it would be to advocate. I don't know what Virginia has in terms of, like, can you ever get your right to vote back? Um, so we like, created a community college job training program. We have a GED program. We are, we've got the business school involved, teaching them entrepreneurship skills. So we're trying to work at multiple levels yes. um, to make sure that they have a livelihood when they walk out. Right. 
But there's something also that's happening with their psyche that I think also is an opportunity for intervention. Well, that was my piece. So, um, one of the things I want to, I mean, I want to echo um, what Dr. Jones has already um, stated, which I think is the, the obvious, that men transitioning in and out of um, uh, jails and prisons need um, a, a sort of receiving blankets um, on, you know, when they return to, to society. It's impossible for us to expect um, them to reconstitute and um, regain their contact and connection with humanity if we strip them of every right um, to, um, to uh, integrate. So I think that's a societal issue we need to address because they are coming home. And if we don't ready ourselves for that and help create a system of passage for them, then we're going to see a cycle repeating itself. But the, the, the question you asked about the mental health needs of, of, of black men and other marginalized men who are, who are navigating in, through, and out our uh, institutional system is a critical one. And I think what we've been trying to do at the community level um, through lots of community-based organizations is to erect emo emotion emancipation circles, or EECs. And I'm working with an organization um, nationally called the Community Healing Network, and we are doing these um, rapid response EECs in cities like Ferguson, like Baltimore, um, when issues like this arise to go into those communities. And I believe this model could be really helpful in institutionalized settings. One, because um, you may have to change the name from healing circles or you know, men may not um, feel as comfortable about that title. But the idea behind a healing circle is about letting men air their traumas and air their exposures in a way in a safe space and to facilitate peer um, connection and, he and peer tr healing and to create a unification, a system of, um, of um, elevated humanity in the men and communities who are um, exposed. The idea isn't to fix it, to resolve it, but to give men a safe space to talk about it, which I think is really helpful and important. Uh, Dr. Rich raised this also, which is really a problem for our society. We have a very low threshold for black male pain. And I could probably insert all kinds of other marginalized groups in that category, but we have a very, very low threshold. So when black men speak about their pain, we're quick to the resolution, we're quick to talk about forgiveness. But sometimes we need to bury the hatchet but leave the handle sticking out, right? So that folks can feel like their pain and their experiences are heard and understood and people respect that they have had an experience. Resilience means that you have had a hit the bounce back is what we want to focus on, but the hit is also important, and I think you get that. So I think in institutionalized settings, there needs to be more opportunities to, for folks to come together and to talk about those experiences with providers, with other inmates, and um, with the energy in mind that this isn't about um, putting them on a medication or getting the, their psychosis fixed. This is about restoring humanity, um, which is a different mental health goal, um, I think, than we often focus on. Uh, so for the sake of time, we can take two very, very brief questions um, and have very, very uh, sure. brief responses for our panelists because we are going to come back to you for closing uh, you can comments. Blame it on my Pentecostal upbringing. <laughs> <laughs> We're long with it. Um, and before before many of you get away, please um, make sure you fill out your session evaluations. So. Hi, my name is Jenny Cohen. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm currently at UCSF, and the question really is about these expanding lenses of focus. We've had the population, the systems level. As a primary care doctor, what language and resources can I use when I have a patient sitting in front of me who I know ha is grappling with far more than I can understand or conceive of, and I want to connect, and I want to help? I think the first... Um order of business, and I think this is already happening among medical professionals, we need to co-locate primary care and mental health care, and we need a depression screening, other kinds of um, mental health screening in the primary care setting, especially for men and boys who may only come every 10 years when an arm's falling off or something. Um, <laughs> we need to get them when they, when they walk through the door, and that screening has to happen in that space. It will help remove stigma so they don't have to go see a psychologist immediately, but, and it also will help create continuity of care. I would just add that I think the, the burden starts with us, which is what are we bringing to that encounter? Do we know what we're bringing to that encounter? Do we have a sense of what, what um, biases we are manifesting in that? Because those are, those are often felt. They're experienced as body language. And I think we also 
owe ourselves to understand this larger context in which this healthcare is happening. It, the fact is that, you know, to the previous question, it is, what a tragedy that the only place that these young people feel like they can get health care is incarcerated. That, that is, in a sense, that's a system that, is, um, that has a particular design and a particular attempted outcome. So I think we start um, with being there, but also understanding the context in which these young people are coming and understanding that there are these other systems, interlocking systems, that are weighing them down as well. We have to have a voice to think about how to change those. Okay, and for our final question, again, for the sake of time, we're going to ask you to have that question be brief, and you'll get a brief response. Hi, I'm Ernie Escobar from Wild Cornell. Um, one of my students, former students, actually, is now a resident at, in Boston, and she very movingly wrote a blog in the New York Times about two weeks ago on um, her observations of a patient of hers who was a prison, uh, who, who was in prison, uh, um, who was going to be supposed to be in prison, and he was happened to be in the hospital, and. She basically very movingly describes how this patient of hers basically had no rights whatsoever that, that we normally give to our patients. He, he, she couldn't um, interview the patient without the police officer. The, the inmate couldn't actually watch television while in, in the hospital. And I think the interesting thing for me was the fact that this is, of course, something I had observed before. But for me, it was the norm. And what do we do when and you talk about advocacy and, you know, our mentees are seeing things that we as the mentors actually have become inured to, and what do we tell them? Well, I guess the first thing is to value them and to be open. When people, it was the same thing that, that Dr. Rich said, you know, why is it that we didn't believe the stories of young people when they were talking about, and older people when they're talking about police violence for ages? We need to... Um, seek out other people's stories and we need to value those stories. And so one way to not be inured is to maybe debrief routinely with house staff that you're working with or whatever and what did you see and, and maybe have a, at the end, you know, what, what are the, maybe have like a, a social justice debrief after each day of rounding or something like that, wouldn't that be an interesting thing to incorporate so that we could all put all of our eyes on it? I just wanted to, it's sparking something else, it's not directly to your question, but it's sort of like um, owning it as our issue. You know, when people talk about white allies, like how, you know, you know, I want to be a white ally. Okay, well that's good, but when you're talking about an ally, you're talking about being an ally in somebody else's struggle. And this is all of our struggle. And so like what white folks need to do, I mean, we could do the ally thing, but they need to be talking to white folks about racism and, and stuff like that. And so that would be, an, and just to feel okay being vulnerable, maybe you don't know, and then maybe you have to learn from other people. I just want to give you the story. I know you said short, but <laughs> do you remember last summer, I think it was in Texas, there was a swimming party and there were some people who had gone into the swimming pool and yes. they came on, the police officer was sitting on this young woman and, and the, the boys were sitting on the curb and all. How did we know about that? We know about that because one of their friends took a cell phone video and that friend who was white said that he felt like he was invisible to the police. He said that when, further, when interviewed later. Now, here he was in the same party. His friends are being sat on and, and all like that. He could have run home. But he understood that he was invisible to the police, and he used his white privilege to document what's happening to his friends. And in all of, we can all do that. So whatever vantage point you're in, you can be documenting racism and you could be acting out and all. And so when you recognize your white privilege, it's not like you cannot shed it in this current day and time. So you might as well use it. <laughs> It is and too bad that if, we don't if, have more time. If we, I we, could just make one, I'm sorry. Oh, no. We were just saying that we wish that we had a, a, a handheld mic so that she could drop it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and not to be indelicate about this, but I'll say it the way that some of my patients might say it. The police be making shit up. <laughs> they make up rules in the hospital that aren't actually rules. So part of what happens is, you know, 
you, you have, we have to make sure that we are in control in the hospital setting. Where, where can police go? We've had situations where a young person came in and had been injured. The police, uh, the, the police officer told the hospital emergency department personnel that the child's parents could not go back and see the child. Like, wh where did they get the power? And yet we as providers often acquiesce to the police telling us what to do in our own setting. This whole notion of I've had um, prison guards who decided they were going to pay for the television and turn it so the patient couldn't see it. Are, are we selling, are we running out TVs to just passers-by in our settings? No. Uh, so I, I would say that one, in, one way institutionally would be to go back and ask your institution to review those policies and make them clear and explicit. And if you don't like them, then advocate to change them. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So it is too bad that we don't have uh, more time to continue with the discussion, but please complete the evaluation because that's going to be essential for us to come again. So it is before, before the applause, it is, it, it is important to recognize uh, the individuals and the organizations that contributed to this event to make it possible. Um, the symposium organizers have already recognized at the beginning, so I'm going to skip there. But I, just, just to give thanks to the video testimonial speakers, Julian Didier, Marshall Florent, Leroy Hicks, and George Shelton. Thank you, and we need to give a special thanks for instrumental support to Monica Lipson and also Garth Graham, president of the Edna Foundation. And this work would not have been possible without the financial support of the Edna Foundation, the Medical School Information Services of the University of Michigan, and also the Office for Health, Health Equity and Inclusion of the University of Michigan Health System and Yale University School of Medicine, Department of Internal Medicine. Thank you very much.